Well, Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the Sabbath. Father, we just come to worship you and glorify your name. Father, as we delve into this subject that we're talking about at the moment, help us to understand and perceive what's, what you're saying, what you're trying to teach us. Father, we thank you for your word, and your word is truth. Amen. So today we're into part two of our teaching on the Great Tribulation. And we're going into uh, part of Matthew 24, which Yeshua taught, he's teaching some of his disciples about signs and what to look for and, and the days that we're in. So with that being said, what are the signs of tribulation and the Great Tribulation? So we will begin in Matthew 24, verses 3 to 5. And it says, Now he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Yeshua answered them and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. So this is the first thing he says to his disciples in regards to this whole thing about the end times and tribulations and great tribulations. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. And just before this verse, if you go back to the start of Matthew 24, it talks about how he says that uh, they were looking at the buildings in Jerusalem and that he says that none of these stones will be standing on top of each other. And then they say, well, when will these things be? When will this happen? This is the context. And then he says, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying I am the Messiah and will deceive many. So the Greek word here used for deceive is plano. Plano, I should say, plano. And this word deceiving, that the English has rendered plano, means to cause to stray, to lead astray, to lead aside from the rigid way. Now, with this being said, this word plano and this whole idea about being led astray, this needs to be understood from the time it was said. Not from our time, from the time when he said it, and in the context that it was written in, which was the first century. So, with this in mind, in the first century, the meaning of sin was to break the Torah. That's what the meaning was to them when he said about, let no one deceive you, let no one cause you to go astray from the rigid path. So to sin, which was to break the Torah, meant to go, to go astray, to walk off away from the path of righteousness, which also meant to them Yahweh's teachings and instructions, the Torah. This is what he's teaching them. Let no one deceive you. Let no one cause you to go off that rigid way, off that path of righteousness. And we have to look at these things and keep in mind that the time and the context it was written. Ones who taught people to do this were deceivers. In Yeshua's eyes, they were the deceivers. And he said that many would come in his name and deceive many. So that is future tense as well. So in the context of this, that one who taught people to go astray were ones that taught people to follow after a different way to to go astray onto their way. So in context, again, of this being said and taught by Yeshua to his disciples, there was no Sunday worship, replacing the Sabbath day. That wasn't even around. It wasn't even heard of. Um, there was no pagan festival. Uh, they didn't have pagan festivals and feasts were tied to Yahweh's way in no way, shape or form, in, in any way washed up so ever. There was no acceptance of their feast and their ways being part of that rigid way. This is the context. 
None of it was accepted. To them, that was sin. To them, that was somebody that's deceived you and you've gone off the, the path and you've been led astray. This word has been coming to pass for nearly 2,000 years since he said that, and it still continues to this day. There are many deceivers today still pushing doctrines of men and demons, which is sin, because we have to keep the context in mind, and that still applies to today. Doing exactly what the Messiah said would be done. There will be false teachers and prophets, one who will perform, perform great signs and wonders. This is why we have the test of a prophet in Deuteronomy 13, 1-5. And there have been people in the past that have performed signs and wonders and still do today. But this is why Yeshua is said to test them by the Torah of what a prophet is, and that is in Deuteronomy 13, verses 1-5. to True teachers and prophets will teach and live the Torah. Even in our day today, do not get caught up in the signs and wonders, but there will be signs and wonders that give glory to Yahweh. And we have to discern between the signs and wonders that don't give glory to Yahweh and the signs and wonders that do give glory to Yahweh. And there will be signs and wonders to deceive and cause ones to worship other gods, to worship the man. And there's plenty of ministries around today where Men are doing things in his name and they get worshipped. They get the attention. Or to lead people to worship on other days and to have other feasts. And I think we all understand what that means. The Hebrew word ta'ah is the one that is used for panao in the Greek. Ta'ah. And this word means to cause to err. So err is to sin, to go astray, to wander and stagger. There are several Hebrew words that are used to translate the uh, that, that are used from the panao, and we'll see some of those now. In the Young's Little Translation, this is his word ta'a in this verse, Genesis 21, 14. And Abraham riseth early in the morning and taketh bread and a bottle of water and give unto her Hagar, placing it on her shoulder also the lad, and sendeth her out, and she goeth on and goeth astray in the wilderness of Beersheba. So that word, that phrase there, goeth astray in the wilderness, that's this Hebrew word ta'ah. So she was sent off onto another path, not the path that the others were on. Another Hebrew word that's not ta'a, that's used in the um, ESV, is in Deuteronomy 4.19. And it says, And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you will be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God or your, Yahweh your Elohim has allotted to all the peoples under the whole of heaven. So here we see it's to uh, not be drawn away by worshipping the sun, the moon and the stars. That's another Hebrew word that in the Septuagint, in that word is the word panao, which is what is a deception. This is the word deceiving. Do not be deceived by them and bow down to them and serve them. Talking about the sun, the moon and the stars, which we see in today's culture as well. And it was evident back way back then in the nations which were pagan cultures. And another example is in Deuteronomy 27, 18. Curse is the one who makes the blind to wander off the road, and all the people shall say Amen. So again, this is this Greek word panao used in this verse. To wander off the road. Curse is the one who deceives or causes deceptions for, to, to cause one to wander off the road. A bit like this slide. Curses the one who causes and draws one's away off the path of Yahweh. And another example 
is in Deuteronomy 13 verse 5. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which Yahweh your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. So this verse here is the verse that we spoke about earlier about the test of a prophet. This is the one that causes deception and deceives that Yeshua was referring to in Matthew chapter 24. So all these verses have different Hebrew words, but that same Greek word, panao, which is a deception and deceiving. But we see the similar theme of going astray, away from Yahweh's path, and that of deception and being deceived. So this is the first thing Yeshua warned his disciples. Be careful not, let no one deceive you. Take heed, let no one deceive you. Matthew 24, 6 to 8, we're moving on now in that same chapter. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Like I said last time when we spoke on part one, when it comes to these matters, I'm very conservative to declaring what times and days we're in. It takes a lot of evidence for me because as a teacher, I think it should. <laughs> Not just to uh, lead people off into hysterics. So it says here, you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. And we all know this verse. Well, we are seeing this happen in our world right now. But I need to balance this, this out. This has been going on since this was declared in Yeshua's day. This is our history of the last 2,000 years. Even in his day, there were these things were taking place. In his days, they were living under foreign rule and there were wars after his ascension with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And then there was the war with the Simon Bar Kokhba revolt in 130 to 136 AD. And this was when the Jewish nation was defeated and they lost their land until regaining it again in 1948. Keep this in mind, in just over the last hundred years, there has been World War I and World War II, the two bloodiest, most horrific and greatest loss of life than any other war or wars in history. Throughout history, there has been many famines, pestilences. For example, we had the uh, bubonic plague. That killed millions. The Spanish flu with estimations between 10 to 50 million, maybe even more, they don't know. And there's also been great earthquakes. I do believe we are in the end times. That's my own personal belief. However, I am still cautious as to where we are at. In all, the, in all the historical events the world has gone through over the last 2,000 years, I'll tell you this, they would all have believed that they were in the end times. If you lived in the bubonic plague, I guarantee they would have been looking at this verse. If you lived in the times of the Spanish flu, I guarantee they were looking at this verse. If you lived in World War I and World War II, I guarantee they were looking at this verse. They, all these people that lived through all these horrific events in our history would have all been declaring this. They would have believed they were living in the days of Matthew 24. Even the Christians within the last decade who have died for their faith in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan and various places of Africa 
would have all by the head of by the head of ISIS, ISIS, and also wars in their countries that decimated their cities and towns. They would have all thought this as well. Even now today, this very hour that we're standing here, with what is happening in Russia, Ukraine, I can guarantee you, those that live in Ukraine would feel like. This is a great tribulation. They have lost everything. They don't have a. They don't have nothing in some areas of Ukraine. There are many that believe today, as I do, that we are at the very beginning of sorrows, and we just started, and we're just starting to feel a slight squeezing. For those that were here in part one, remember what tribulation meant in a concrete. Meaning to squeeze, to compress. We are at the very beginning, in my opinion, of that squeezing and compressing. That's what tribulation means from a Hebraic perspective. But for me, there needs to be more evidence. And why do I say that? As there are still many out there saying we have gone through these things before. For example, inflation... Cost of living pressures and interest rates are still very low compared to when they were in the 80s. I remember my parents saying, this is nothing. <laughs> it was 18, 20% when you were growing up. Imagine that today. So I still need to see more evidence. But with that being said, the evidence is mounting. We are living in times now of unprecedented advancements in technology and what they are talking about and probably already doing with these technologies in regards to security, biosciences and surveillance. And they all go hand in hand and intermingled. Adds to the weight of how these things can now be implemented on a global scale, which has never been around before, I must admit. And not only that, debt levels are at unprecedented levels. So I can see now how certain things that the Bible talks about can cause things to come to pass. But we need to understand this is all by the hand of Yahweh. The devil's not doing this. Yahweh is doing it. It's not the devil. And like I said, we wouldn't even know the half of what is going on behind closed doors with the agendas of certain global organisations, individuals. We wouldn't have a clue. But I want to bring us back to our verses in Matthew 24, 6-8. Yeshua says this. I'm going to read it out again. And you will hear of wars and rumours of war. See that you are not troubled. That's the key in this verse. It's not the wars and the rumours of wars. It's not the earthquakes. It's not nation rising against nation or kingdom against kingdom. It's see that you're not troubled. These are just witnesses to what he says is coming to pass, which I think is a fantastic, great promise. He says, see that you're not troubled. The Greek word for troubled is throw eo, throw eo, and it means to be troubled in mind, to be frightened, alarmed, cry aloud, or make a noise by outcry. So this is what he says not to do. Don't do these things. Don't take to the streets and protest. People that do that, they're troubled. That's the manifestation of a troubled mind. Making a loud outcry. Being alarmed, which is what we've all seen in the last two years. Yeshua says not to do that. These things must come to pass. I had this thought the other day. That people that protest and raise their voice and go off like a frog in a sock and cry out aloud, potentially could be crying out aloud against the will of Yah, against what he wants to accomplish on the earth. 
because he says these things must come to pass. This is going to happen whether we like it or not. But he says, do not be troubled. Do not cry out loud. Do not be alarmed or frightened or make a noise. But he says, do not be alarmed and frightened. For a and then he says, but the end is not yet. Paul reaffirms this to his letter to the Thessalonians. So he says, even when these things come to pass, the end is not yet. This is the beginning of sorrows. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 to 4. Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as the day of Mashiach has come. Let no one deceive you by any means. He's just reaffirming what Matthew 24 says. For the day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So in this part of Paul's letter, we get some more clues. Because this is end time language. This is great tribulation passage. We get more clues of signs of these days. Paul warns again about being deceived by false teachers, declaring that Messiah has come. And there are people out there that have said that. This has happened a lot throughout history. There was a time in the mid-19th century known as the Great Disappointment, when there were many that were certain that Messiah was coming and left their jobs, sold their properties, businesses, and they went out into the woods one night, a night that was foretold by their teachers, that Messiah was going to return as the second coming, and they waited, and lo and behold, nothing happened. Many lost their faith that night and walked away from God. Others didn't and continued on. It is said that this is where the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witness come from, These from the aftermath of this event. Even in the last couple of decades, there was a group in the USA that gained a big following. They gave a date for the return of the Messiah. They promoted on billboards, radio, TV, drove small vans and trucks around with banners and signage on the sides of them with the date when Messiah was going to return. They raised millions of dollars that they found out later was invested in the stock market. Lo and behold... It didn't happen. This reveals how many don't know nor read their Bibles. They just go along with the preacher, who in the majority of cases are not following the ways of Yahweh. Remember, we've got to keep to the context of Matthew 24. What are the ways of Yahweh? Torah. They are being deceived, led astray, caused to wander, all because people are not reading the Bible. Yeshua and Paul teach us what to look for. In the passage we just read, let me ask, is there a great falling away? Some would argue there has been. They probably wouldn't be far off in the context of what the Bible says, how one should follow God. Has the man of sin been revealed? The son of perdition? These are questions we need to ask. Is there one that has exalted himself above God, showing himself that he is God? I would say not yet. That, this hasn't happened yet, in my opinion. These are the questions we have to ask. Not freak out at the latest stock market fall or the latest thing that's going on. Just because interest rates have gone up a percent and still at record lows. I would say that we're still we're at the beginning of this compression and this tightening, but there's still a ways to go. Matthew 24, 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. The wars, rumours of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences and earthquakes 
in various places are the beginning of sorrows, and we are told not to be troubled. These things have been going since Yeshua said these things. These things have been happening for 2,000 years. There are some that say that the day that Yeshua died on the cross was the time frame of the beginning of the end. That's a Hebrew view of time. It could be going, we could be in the end, it could have been the end time for 2,000 years. However, we could be in the beginning of sorrows now. The Greek word for sorrows. This is why it's important to break down words to get a better understanding of what's going on. The Greek word sorrows is odin, and it means birth pains, travailing pain, intolerable anguish. This is what the word sorrows means. So more literally, it should say these are the beginning of birth pains, which some translations actually have, or travailings. These are the, uh, those, they, this is the beginning of that time. And I'm not a woman, but I would think that when a woman gives birth, it comes on suddenly. <coughs> it comes on quite quickly. These pains and birth pains, from what I understand. One Thessalonians five three. For when they say peace and safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labour pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So there's another sign here. Another sign is, is when they say peace and safety. This is when we should be watching. And we're all watching. There's millions of people watching. But this is one of the things we should be watching for when they start saying peace and safety. There are some that think in the times of sorrows that there might be a time of reprieve in that period of time and they'll be saying peace and safety. But And then the day of, of the Lord comes like a birth pain on a woman. That's just some people's thoughts because the day of the Lord comes suddenly just like the birth pains. Sort of sounds like no one knows the day or hour. It's like a woman wouldn't know the day or hour these pains, these travailings come on. It just happens. Moving on in our chapter, Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 to 10. And then it says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now remember, he's talking to some disciples. This is the context. He's talking to some of the disciples that asked him about when these things will be. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. What alarming? Many will be offended and deliver up one another. Sounds like tears amongst the wheat to me. Sounds like some that profess his name with their mouth but their walk and their ways are abominable and despicable and they're among us. This is what he teaches. Now the Greek word for offended is scandalizo. This is where we get our English word scandal. Scandalous. Scandalizo. And this means cause to stumble. Many will cause to stumble if we look at our verse. To put a stumbling block or impediment in the way upon which another may trip and fall to be a stumbling block. This is what it says about the uh, times of sorrows. Many will be offended, will betray one another and will hate one another. Sort of like this guy. Cause someone else to stumble by tripping them or causing a stumbling. 
Now, this could also be a part of the falling away that I spoke about earlier and with also those that deceive, that come in his name to deceive many. Again, this has been going on since Yeshua's day, with Yeshua himself being betrayed. He experienced this firsthand. He was betrayed by one of his own. That was one of the twelve. Then we have Stephen. The first martyr was betrayed by his own people. Paul and all the other apostles and disciples of the day, they all experienced tribulations, which we touched on in part one. Paul often said he was afflicted and had experienced tribulations. This has continued to happen all throughout history and is still happening today, but far worse in some places than others. However, in countries like the USA, Australia, UK and Canada and other developed countries, this is starting to heat up as the Bible and its message has now been pushed out the door. Viewed as irrelevant and old school. The message of the Bible and all the principles taught in the Bible is being replaced with tolerance, being progressive, compromising to the acceptance of all lifestyles so as not to cause offence to them. It doesn't matter if their lifestyles are offensive to us as followers of Yahweh. So we're starting to see this happen. People are delivering one another up, especially if you're a believer. Continue on in our chapter in Matthew 24, verses 11 to 12. Then many prophets will rise up and deceive many and become, and sorry, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So again, we've got to keep in mind the context of the time it was written in. What is lawlessness without the Torah? With the Bible and its message being replaced, this is the fruit of those choices and decisions that we just spoke about, where we kick God out of our societies and we have caused to be tolerant to everyone's lifestyles. We're now starting to enter in the time of sorrows and we will start to see the fruit of these choices and decisions that our governments have made. This is why the book of Revelation talks about what it talks about, because we kick God out the door. This needs to be understood from the context and days these words were declared and written. Lawlessness is without the teachings and instructions of Yahweh. At that time, when Yeshua was teaching his disciples, there was no Sabbath day worship on Sunday. The Sabbath day was the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. There were no other so-called Christian feast days. These things came centuries later that evolved and are rooted in paganism. Yeshua teaches to be aware of these things. These are the deceptions. They are not part of Yahweh's ways or his word. Just because you slap the name of Jesus or Christ on them doesn't make them Yahweh's ways. Yeshua said, many will come in my name. This is part of what he is talking about. They who preach these things and ways are false prophets and teachers in the context of the first century. And they have a false message. They have been rising up for 2,000 years. Starting off with most of the early church fathers who introduced replacement theology and anti-Semitism, establishing a religion called Christianity, which has nothing to do with Yeshua, our Messiah, and the first century believers in the way they worship and follow Yahweh. These false ministers are deceiving many. Lawlessness abounds because they teach the Torah is done away with. You don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. Lawlessness is abounding, which are those that are without law, without the Torah, which are the teachings and instructions of Yahweh himself, his own word. It's replaced with a message of grace and love from a modern Western worldview with the attitude that I can live my life how I want because I'm under grace now. I don't have to do anything else. 
I can do whatever I want as long as I'm under grace. Opposite to what Yeshua teaches, he says that you are brought with a price, your life is not your own. However, in him is true freedom and liberality. Consider this, what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And we see this happening. People depart from the faith. We see it in 1 John, the little letters of John. This is where he says that they came from among them, those who were antichrist. They come from among them. They were part of them. The Spirit expressly says that in the latter time, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. This is just another way of what Yeshua said in the start of Matthew 4. Take heed not to be deceived. It's just another way of saying that. The hearts of many are growing cold. We just read in Matthew 24 verses 11 and 12, there were, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. This is what we have to protect against. We have to protect against our hearts becoming cold. Not so much on the wars and the rumours of wars and kingdom against kingdom and pestilences. We have to keep in the fore of our mind not to be troubled, not to be deceived and not to let our hearts grow cold. Hearts grow cold because of lawlessness. The word cold in Greek is suko, and it means to be made or to go cool or cold. Cool by blowing. Blow and to breathe, to be extinguished or grow cold. Now we know that there are other verses in the Bible that warns us about not letting the flame that's within you go out. Don't quench the Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit can blow on the flames of our hearts, the flames of fire, and cause us to be passionate and stirred up about God's ways, well, I would think that there are other spirits that can blow cold and cause that flame to go out and cause your heart to become cold, which is the doctrine of demons and men. Because of lawlessness, your heart grows cold and hard because of lawlessness. Not being in the presence of God, not reading his word, not observing and worshipping on his days. It may seem that at times I just go on all the time about remembering the weekly Sabbath, gathering together on the feast, applying the Torah to your life when applicable, putting Yahweh first before husbands and wives and children and parents, etc. This is all for a reason. I go on about this all the time because it's for a reason. I am discipling and teaching you because this guards you from being deceived. Keeping Yahweh's ways in, in the fore of your life guards you from being deceived. It guards you from your heart going cold. That's why I do it. I'm not doing it to point the finger. I'm doing it to try and guard you and protect you. It's my job. This guards you and your heart from growing cold. When we get attitudes and say within ourselves, this is all just too hard. And I've been there and I've waved that banner many times. That is from the devil. When we get to that place where this is all just too hard, it's just too much, it's just too difficult, that's of the devil. And he wants your heart to grow cold. He wants you to be lawless. He wants you to be away from Yahweh. And I've identified this in my life many times in the past. i am recognised that that is from the devil because it's totally against what God wants. And it produces a cold heart if you stay there long enough. 
It's called staying on the path of another. Those that are sinful. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So where does this all come from? The spirit of power, of love and of a sound mind. This comes from Yahweh's spirit. The Ruach Kadesh. This comes from walking in his ways, from gathering together, from prayer, by putting him first. This is all tied to relationship, having a relationship with God. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love and a sound mind. The Holy Spirit is not a genie in a lamp that you can just rub whenever you feel like it. And he pops out to fulfill whatever the need is at the time. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. He is a guide. He is a helper and he convicts of sin. The Holy Spirit is God. So when we say God never leaves us nor forsakes us, we're talking about the Holy Spirit also. Too many times people just think that they can rub this lamp and the Holy Spirit just pops out to fulfill whatever wish they have at the time. That is not the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 63 verses 9 to 10. In all their afflict, affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But... They rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them. This is Old Testament. They fought against the Holy Spirit. They rebelled against the Holy Spirit. They quenched the Holy Spirit. After all that he did for them, he, he healed them, he, he, he saved them from their affliction, their tribulations in that day and hour. And yet they rebelled and grieved his spirit. And then what's to say? So he turned himself against them and fought against them. This sounds a lot like the book of Revelation. Acts 7.51 It says, You stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. So this is why I go on and on all the time about Sabbath, Yahweh's ways, his feast and prayer and all this is to guard our hearts against resisting the Holy Spirit. To guard our hearts against to becoming cold. Because I'm telling you now, the devil doesn't sleep. He will be at you every day of your life to try and cause your heart to grow cold and to be fearful and to be afraid. To do everything that Yahweh Yeshua teaches not to do in Matthew 24. He says, don't be deceived. Don't be troubled. Don't let your heart grow cold. And the devil will come and do everything that's opposite to that. Because it's not about the wars and the rumours of wars. It's not about the pestilences. It's not about the uh, tribulation. It's about your relationship with God in the end. And if you have a hard heart, well, the rest doesn't matter. Do not quench the spirit. Do not let that flame go out by fear and trepidation of what the times we're in, which is 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Do not quench the spirit. We are told over and over and over again not to resist Yahweh or his ways. This is why all this will happen. This is why the time of sorrows is started. This is why the great tribulation will come. This is why the day of the Lord will come. Because of this. They've resisted the spirit of Yahweh. They've resisted his ways. They've resisted his teachings and instructions. It's because of sin, rebellion, and resisting Yahweh and his Holy Spirit. People doing things their own ways. 
This includes the religious churches who I used to be a part of and preach in. I used to be that person. It includes them who have changed days and seasons. Again, this needs to be weighed as to what did it mean to follow Yahweh and his ways in the first century church. Because this is the context. I will keep pushing Yahweh's ways and adherence to them because this is what encourages, edifies and brings comfort. I will keep advocating to make him and his ways first in one's life so the Holy Spirit will not be quenched. And in Matthew 24, 13, it says, He who endures to the end will be saved. How do you endure? I've said it over and over again already. Follow Yahweh's ways. Don't quench his spirit. Don't forsake the gathering together. He who endures to the end shall be saved. So we've got to keep running the race until the end. Whether we die first or whether we are alive when he returns, we have to endure to the end. So we're going to continue this next time and delve into this more about the end times. This is more so about the times of sorrows. Next time we're going into after that, the day of Yahweh. But it gets better. But this is all to encourage us and edify us and show us not to be troubled. Don't be deceived. And do not quench the Spirit of God and become cold. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it brings peace. Thank you that it, it's truth. And Father, help us to be a people that have a sound mind. For you have given us not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Father, I pray that by your spirit you would continually remind us to guard our hearts. Father, to identify the devil when he comes along with his whispers, with his temptations, with his schemes and devices, and to call it out when it comes. That we would be people that are on fire for you and your ways that you would fan the flame that's within us by your spirit continually. And Father, let us be those people. Help us to guard our hearts and not to be afraid to have a sound mind and to be sober. For this is what you said, do not be troubled. Help us to, have the, uh, to, to, to see when deception comes and to give us the courage and the strength to stand up to it. And Father, I pray with everything that's in me, don't ever, ever, ever let our hearts get cold. Father, help us to be the people that endure to the end. Whatever may come, however it may come, whatever way, shape or form that it comes, Help us to be people that endure to the end. We thank you, Father, for your word. Your word is truth. And your promises are yes and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.